Good evening, my name is Federica Saliola, and I'm a lead economist at the World Bank Group. I was the co-director for the 2019 World Development Report on the Change in Nature of Work. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the World Bank World Development Report, it's our annual flagship. We normally pick one issue which is relevant and hot for development. We look at the stock of knowledge that is out there and we reframe it. So this year is about the change in natural work. The next one will be on trade and, and, and so on. Thank you so much for that. Um, th the World Development Report and the article um, makes um, investment in human capital a priority for government. Um, it focuses, I think, rightly so on lifelong learning beyond uh, formal education. This focus on skills for a future of work and systems for attaining it is, is obviously at the core of, of many of these discussions. But in developing countries, um, is investing in education systems and adult learning enough to develop the capacity needed um, to meet the jobs for the future? Are we missing something? Yeah, so uh, that's a very good question. Clearly, it's not enough. Uh, in fact, what the World Development Report, allow me to use the acronym, the WDR, which is, which is faster. So to actually a step back. So when we started this work, uh, you know, the surrounding literature is very pessimistic about <laughs> the impact of the technological change on labor markets, how many jobs we'll lose. Um, and you know, there are numbers that, that you, know, you can find in many of the um, reports out there. But when, when you look at the scenario in, in the context in low-income countries, you realize that those jobs don't even exist there. The problems that they face are completely different. So for those countries to be able to really embrace technology and take advantage of the opportunities that technology brings, you know, they need to make a few additional steps. And um, as Susan mentioned, one of the three main messages of this report is invest in human capital. Now, while for high-income countries, it is a matter of lifelong learning, about reskilling, about rethinking the tertiary education, how we can train those adults that are losing their jobs, when you look at the low-income countries, they don't even have the, those basic uh, human capital, basic health, basic education. If you think that, if you look at how many kids are standing around the world, I'm more than two million. You know, when we look at how many kids have that early childhood development that allow us to uh, build the skills that we need, there are very few. When you look how many people go to school and they actually learn, about one third. So looking you know, at the situation in, in low-income countries, you realize that those fundamentals that you, know, you need to have in order to be a productive worker are not there. So the World Development Report launched a new index, it's called the Human Capital Index, where we basically translate this missing investment, that lack of human capital, into productivity. And we do so because everybody is aware of the importance of human capital, but not having, not, we haven't been able really to, to build you know, those, those fundamentals that we thought we can assume you know, by now we would have built. So we try to change the incentive. Instead of discussing human capital just with the ministers of education or health, we want to discuss it with ministers of finance too. And then it's not enough. Right? You, keep, you need to keep learning. Right? This technological change, what brings to labor market, it's fast changing. There are new jobs that appear in labor markets overnight. If you think about iPhones, if you think about the job of app developers, there are four million app developers in India. And those really came to the market you know, in no time. So it is important to continue learning. It's not enough to acquire the education that you need during primary and secondary school. You need to continue. And to do that, we need to rethink tertiary education and other things. And it's, so one message, one important element is human capital, but that's also not enough. The World Development Report also um, emphasizes the importance of rethinking social protection and also rethinking our fiscal policies. Uh, he, he has a big call for action for governments in terms of 
better investment in human capital, better investment in social protection, but also making sure those additional investments are sustainable. So we need to think ahead of time how we create the fiscal space to be able to support those additional investments. Great, thank you. Um, my next question is about the treatment of social protection that you mentioned in the report. Um, can you clarify the position in the report in your article which appears to advance um, a decoupling of social insurance from work, mm -hmm. cutting employers' social insurance contributions or introducing very low ceilings for insurable earnings and advocating a universal basic income. Are you giving up on work? Related to this, how can developing countries move from what is now a very limited social safety net, if at all, to UBI that's sufficiently um, high to reduce poverty? Yeah, it is true. We advocate for decoupling social protection from having a formal, traditional nine-to-five job. Why we do that? So the technological change, as I mentioned, um, you know, brings a lot of new jobs, new tasks to the market very quickly. So in a way, it increases the risk for workers, right? To be able to acquire those skills, to be able to change, you know, to move from one job to the other, you know, what we call the job tenure, like how many years on average people stay on the job, this is changing very fast. It used to be 13 years in the United States, now it's seven years. It will be faster and faster. So what people face, it's, it's kind of higher risk, or let's say more, more need to move faster from one job to the other or acquire different skills. So let me re-emphasize the fact that we all very worried about how many jobs robot would take away. That let's look again at the situation in low-income countries or middle-income countries. Right? If we're very worried about those changing, let's ask ourselves the question, what is not changing in those countries? So if you look at the share of informal workers in those countries, you see that over the past 30 years, that has not changed. And in, on average, 65% of workers are in low productivity, low skills, informal jobs. That means they don't get any social protection. So they, they will never be able to manage those risks that I just mentioned. Just to give you a few numbers. The social insurance in low-income countries is 1%. If you ask what's the coverage in high-income countries, it's 65%. If you take India, Indonesia, Nigeria, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, one third of the world population, as the, the coverage of social protection in those countries, insurance, it's one digit. And if you look at the social assistance, which is the income, it's about 22%. So why? Because social protection is based on what? On wage contribution. So meaning if you have a formal, traditional job, because if you have a gig workers, you don't get, if you work for a platform, you also don't get social protection. So you need to be in those traditional jobs. So how many people get it? Very few. So the, the, what the, the World Development Report recommends is let's decouple social protection from having a formal traditional job and let uh, we advocate for a universal social protection. So where everybody gets it. And with an approach that goes from bottom up, right? Instead of, you know, normally, you know, social protection is given to the people that exist. Let's start with the informal. Let's, let's be universal so the poor gets it first. And the WDR does not advocate for universal basic income. It discusses, because it's very hotly, it's hotly debated, a lot of low-income countries are considering it. So then we present some scenarios. The universal basic income is unconditional, it's given to everybody, it's cash. Now, this could benefit some people, but could harm others, depending on what's the tax, system, what are the benefits in place? Just let me give you some example. In Nepal, the UBI will, will help people, but it will cost 20% of GDP. Is that sustainable? Well, you know, we can discuss that. In a country like South Africa, for example, it would actually harm the elderly, right? So, so depending on what schemes are in place, so, and this is perhaps a message that has been misunderstood. We don't advocate. We just wanted to show the pros and cons, but this discuss among many other options, like negative tax income and, and many others. So thank you.